my name is Adam Benet. I'm the Center of Excellence for Digital Innovation Lead at uh, the Department of Education, EECD, here in New Brunswick. And uh, this is the fourth of a six-part series I've been doing on digital literacy. Um, and uh, I'm so honored today to have a graphic designer and actually a partner of mine, uh, a partner of our organizations uh, uh, joining us in Cheryl Wilson here. And um, so what I'll do is um, I'll uh, give a brief presentation about some of the concepts that we're going to talk about in digital literacy and specifically in creativity, design and problem solving. And then I'll hand it over to Cheryl to talk about well, she's a practitioner of the stuff. So that's the cool thing. So I'm, I'm super thrilled to have an, uh, a real live um, practicing uh, a creative person on the call. So um, I'll jump into it. So um, so again, my name is Mr. Benet, Adam Benet. Uh, I'm basically uh, been a middle and high school teacher in the Moncton area since about 2008. And this year I'm um, representing the Centers of Excellence. And our goal is to do all kinds of different things, but expose students to all the different careers that are out there um, in digital technologies. And essentially digital technology touches every single career. Um, and we're just trying to encourage more students to think about doing that flip from being a consumer uh, with digital tools to a creator. Um, so what are ways that you, instead of playing the video game, are you gonna make the video game? Instead of watching all the TikToks and Instagram and things, why don't you be the one that makes it, right? Instead of watching TV and movies, we want you to think about that. Uh, same with like graphics. So um, I'll dive into a few things and we'll kind of get going. So um, the first thing I would ask, as the class is sitting there right now, right? The just and and if you want to answer, you can come to the, the mic or the uh, webcam and do it. If you just want to talk as a small group for uh, just a just a minute, you can as well. And 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 ponder this question, right? Does technology allow for more creativity, or does it actually limit our creative ability as human beings? So that is a starting point. I'll just give uh, just you know sixty seconds. If anybody wants to jump on. You're more than welcome. And if you want to put something in the chat box, you're more than welcome to do that as well. And I'll just let that sit with you for a minute. And without giving too, too much away, right? Think about what is technology allowed for? In our life, in our world, right? There's different inventions over time. And as these inventions come around and human beings learn about them, right? Does it allow for new ways to express one's ideas, uh, concepts, designs, right? That didn't exist before. So maybe that's a way that technology actually can allow for greater creativity. However, on the other side, right? And that's an important thing to always look at both sides of something. It kind of can take away from our ability to have that creative output because we're constantly just consuming the thing. And sometimes it's sort of a funny way to think about it, but if you're just passively consume, or consuming all the things on the internet, on your phone, on a tablet, on a gaming console, right? Does that actually affect your creativity? Does it limit it? So that's a big part of what digital literacy is all about is to say, you know, think about how you can improve something in the world. Think about how you can make something better, right? Um, other cool things about technology, right? Collaboration. We didn't have this level of ability to collaborate, even what we're doing here today on a Teams call. And that didn't exist until not all that long ago, really. So it gives us so many abilities to have creative output, which is pretty cool. So the next one to ponder just a little bit as a class would be uh, how important is diversity of creative ideas and minds in the actual creation, invention of technology and different design, right? So you can sit there and kind of think about that as at your desk or with your teacher, but I just wanted to, you know, throw a few uh, uh, ideas your way. And again, without that diversity of creative minds, and Looking around your classroom, right? Think of all the different people that are in there and the different lives that all of them have lived. Each one of us as human beings brings with us our own unique life experiences. And so that's important when we come together to do design work and to create and innovate as well, because we need that diversity to help make better products, better things that'll reach more people. Um, and, and it's really important to think about that. 
uh, as we move forward in the world. So my big message to the students that are listening and watching today is think about technology as a pretty amazing tool that can do pretty amazing things. Yeah, we have to have a healthy relationship with it, right? We don't, there's addiction issues and there's mental health issues that go along with it. But as a tool to actually put something into the world that's really unique in your own, that to me is where I see the power of technology for sure. So what are we talking about when we're talking about creativity, design, and problem solving? Okay, so this is just a, 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 a kind of directly from what's known as our digital literacy framework. I know it's sort of a big word, but it's something that exists here in the province of New Brunswick, and, and we hope that students and teachers learn about it. So we want students to explore a variety of digital technologies to develop and enhance ideas, products, or processes through your creative expression and innovate designs to solve issues that affect you, your community, your school, your town, your city, the province, the country, and the world. And we want students to explore different digital tools to create new ideas, products, or solutions that help them, their community, and the world. So sit back for just a moment and think about that. Can I use digital tools and technology to actually create something new, to provide a solution to a problem, and to help with the community? It's pretty neat to think about, actually, because if you look around, you might come up with an idea and say, hmm, there is a way that technology could help with this. And one of the coolest things to do is to be part of a solution, right? A lot of us, it's easy to complain about things, and it's easy to see issues that are out there, but actually coming up with ideas to solve those problems, especially with our access to technology and partners like Brilliant Labs. If you've pretty much every school in this province, you've had a chance to work with Brilliant Labs and, and be it robotics or coding, uh, 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 design. There's so many things that we can solve now and there's you have access to experts in the field, which is really cool. And that's why I love to work with people like Brilliant Labs and others, right? To get out there and do the things in your school. So. I just want to put that in your mind as well um, as you move forward. So we'll go through a couple more things about what creativity design and problem solving is as a digital literacy uh, um, uh, area. And I don't want to talk too long because I want to hand it over to our guest speaker. So the first one, there's four major uh, areas that we'll hit on. OK, so the first one is this: students learn basic design thinking steps to come up with ideas, create prototypes. That's a cool word prototypes, you might have heard of it before, but you might not have, right? To test your designs, to make improvements, and to create new products and solutions to solve real life problems. Again, your assignment, not that I want to give out homework here, but as you go about your life, you get on the school bus after school, you go home, right? In your daily life, think about ways that you can actually solve some problems that exist. And students are really good at seeing problems sometimes that adults don't. So it's sort of like your little superpower that you might be able to see something in the world that's like, hmm, I can make that better. There, there has to be a better way. That's what it's all about, right? Um, so you, 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 once you've identified that problem, you want to research and understand the sorts of problems that 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 problem impacts, and then you say, hmm, can I use digital tools and strategies to explore some solutions? Maybe, maybe not. Not everything can be solved by technology. That's for sure has a limited uh, you know, uh, ability. But then the cool thing about technology is you can create things like models and prototypes, or you can do simulations. So that's where something like technology allows us to really get in, in the lab, I'll, I'll say, to experiment, to tinker, to explore. And with tech, digital technologies, usually there's the magical thing called undo, <laughs> or you can restore work. If you mess something up, you can go back, right? And or you could scrap the whole idea and start fresh. But um, unlike real world, like if we were in the kitchen making a, a, a banana bread, right? If you fall asleep while the bread's baking and then you wake up and it's burnt or overdone, it's kind of too late. You have to start from scratch with the physical products, but maybe you don't have any more eggs or ripe bananas. With technology, usually we can reboot, restart, Right, it, it almost has infinite possibilities as that space to tinker and explore. That's the real power as I see it. 
And that's something that comes along with this idea of prototypes. You can make something and try it. If it doesn't work, go back and make another prototype or tinker or adjust, right? So again, there's always limitations and there could be risks. Um, and getting to work with others is one of the greatest parts of using digital tools. You can work with experts, you can work with friends, maybe you have a cousin or a relative that lives in Vancouver or somewhere in the United States or in Europe. You can actually get together and co-create things. I love the ability to collaborate using digital tools. So if we look at the engineering design process, as you can see on this graphic here, right? Again, in your life, look at a, find a problem. It's sort of like what we would do with the science or STEM fair, right? You kind of look around and say, hmm, I could come up with a way to make it better. Look at a problem, you plan, you imagine. Having imagination is really important in technology as well and in life in general. And then create, go do the thing. But then after that, you should do the testing and the improving and then the sharing. So it's part of a, a cycle that goes on and on, right? So I do really would love for you all as students to think about that a little bit and think about in your daily life, just you have to explore and try because if you never do those things, you'll never know. So here's an example, right, of what we could talk about from a, a rough idea, right, to sort of a prototype, right? That process to get there takes work. So uh, uh, app development, what we're looking at here, that's certainly an area. Somebody has an idea, but there's a lot that goes into it. The design of it, what it actually looks like for the user to, to work with and interact. But then there's the back end, what, what has to do with the coding and the computer science. And if you look at the, the, the purple graphic, that iteration from just a, maybe a pencil or line drawing to a rough prototype to a finished product, right? That's what we're talking about. That process, there's so much learning that happens and that's the really the fun part of technology. So the second thing is students use digital tools to express themselves cre creatively, to come up with new ideas and show their learning and challenge assumptions, right? So you can explore ways that say like artists might use technology to reach a bunch of different audiences. How has technology changed things like the music industry, right? Somebody with a great idea and, and, the, and the desire can sit with a laptop and make a song or make an album in their bedroom alone, right? Same with like a video game, same with different graphic design projects. It's really sitting there for you to just play. You can understand things like um, how multimedia, so like texts and images, um, create sort of meaning and how digital tools can actually shape our culture. If you know what TikTok is or you know what Instagram is, there's certain songs and dance moves and trends like with food and stuff that is so directly um, impacted by technology because it's so rapid, it's so fast. Uh, a neat or fun idea can go from one place to another literally overnight now. And again, using these tools to come up with new ideas. Sometimes we're creating things that never existed before, which is the really, really neat part of technology as well, right? And again, is it just for your use, right? Maybe you're someone that likes to write, right? Maybe you go home and you journal and you write or you write short stories or poetry. And sometimes that's just for you and that's personal. You can do the same thing with technology. You're just playing around, right? And that's yours that you, you, you just keep. And maybe one day you say, you know what? I want to share this with the world. And that's another great thing that you can do. Um, we can look at other things in remix, right? You've heard that word before probably, but taking other technology or taking other things that are out there and put your own unique spin on it. Right? That's another really great thing about digital technology is because we can share files and images and videos and all of those sorts of things. Um, so the next one is an important one as well, and that is students will learn about and respect the rights and responsibilities of using, creating, and sharing creative work. So you might be sitting here saying, geez, what is that? Copyright and all those sorts of things. So it is really important to understand that on the internet, and just like writing an essay when you get older into high school and things like that, when you're doing a project, if you get information from a particular website or book, right, you're supposed to say, okay, that's where I got the information from. You, you cite it is what we would call that in high school. Um, with digital technologies, same, we have to do the same sorts of things, right? I really can't go and take uh, somebody's song and do something without their permission. Okay, same with images a lot of the time. So there's something called copyright that impact that. And it's just important to understand that. 
And another part of this kind of loops back to something I would, I would say that I would have talked about with digital citizenship is that if you get really good at creating videos or graphics, you can actually do some pretty mean and bad stuff with it too. And so if you get good at say like graphic design, right? And you can put somebody's head on somebody else's body, right? We need to be careful about that, right? Things we do like that, we need to have our friends permission when we're doing things like that. We shouldn't just be doing that, especially not to be mean or to bully. And it's really important because it can be really hurtful. So I know that's a bit of a more serious one, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. And the last thing of the four for creativity, design, and problem solving is this. So students find ways that digital tools can be used, designed, and created to help the environment, right? So we're living in a time where, you know, things like uh, global warming and climate change are impacting our lives. Is there a way that digital technologies can actually help make situations better, right? In fact, I was thinking, trying to get some graphics and logos, but if you look at the top right corner here, what we're literally doing right now today with a video conference, right? The technology has been around for quite a while now, but it's really popular and used probably by everybody at one time or another for work and personal, FaceTime, Zoom, Teams, right? It goes on and on. The ability to have a meeting with a human being with the webcam, right? That allows us to kind of feel like we're in the room with the person, but think about all the travel that might save. Right? So we think about gas and fuel and emissions, airplanes and cars and buses. By being able to do this, right, we can lessen our carbon footprint a little bit. Now, the technology still requires electricity. The internet re requires electricity. But um, compared to us jumping in a car and me driving to your school, right, the carbon emission or your footprint is, is lessened. Right? So that's just one example of how technology can actually uh, allow for um, a, a greener, more environmentally uh, friendly practices, right? And then there's other issues too about like uh, what we call e-waste. So you all probably have this, that broken tablet or computer or laptop at your house, right? Or at your school even, right? Unfortunately, we have a lot of that electronic waste and it's a hard thing to get rid of, um, but doing it properly is even harder. So luckily in New Brunswick now there is, you know, the ability, if you have your broken laptop or printer or television, right, there, we have a system now where you can actually take that device, drop it off in your community, and then it will go and get stripped apart and, and dispose of properly, but hopefully recycle some of the bits and pieces. One of the things that I keep an eye open for is there's new co companies that are creating computers and different smartphones that are actually meant to be repairable and upgraded over time. Because there's nothing worse than having a laptop that everything works fine except for this one part of it. And then you have to throw the whole thing out, right? So those are the ways that we can think about how can we make the environment a little bit better and think about our, car our carbon footprint and all those sorts of things for technology. So those are the four sort of main areas that are creativity, design, and problem solving. And I thought it would be pretty cool today if we had a guest speaker that could talk about the application of what we just talked about. So I, like what I would call a practitioner, somebody actually doing the thing. So uh, I was so thrilled to have uh, Cheryl Wilson join us today. And so Cheryl is the Director of Marketing and Communications at Brilliant Labs. So Brilliant Labs, you probably know the organization that might have been in your school and hopefully done some things with your classes over time. Um, but the group itself or the uh, Brilliant Labs itself has a graphic designer that actually does a lot of the work uh, for the website and different publications that they put out. And I, I really enjoyed Cheryl's quote here. So design is not just about making things look good. It's about creating a powerful message that connects with people on a deeper level. It can transform ideas into reality. And your designs can speak directly to the hearts and minds of your audience. Right? I know you're, you're, you, know, you might only be in grade four or five or six or seven right now, but as you get older and as you make more and more products, especially for school, right, think about those things. And we all, we all have to care about creativity, design, and language, and, and it's crucial as it gives you the power to shape the world around you with your unique perspective and innovative ideas. Embrace the power of design and unleash your creativity to inspire and motivate others. So I love that quote. I love everything in there. I encourage all of you to be creative and don't lose that creative uh, uh, interest in the world. 
And right now you could start like when you get home or ask your teacher if you want to do design work, if you want to work on making videos, if you want to 3D print, if you, there's so many things that digital tools allow us to do now. So I will stop sharing my screen here pretty quick. And uh, <laughs> I will hand it over now uh, to, to Cheryl. Oh, sorry, Cheryl, I have, sorry, my apologies. I do have. I'm just going to pull this up. Yeah, I have a little intro for, for Cheryl, my apologies. So Cheryl Wilson is a marketing and communications director at Brilliant Labs, which is a charity focused on advancing STEAM. And I love that the A is in there. Education for youth in Atlantic Canada since 2016, with over 25 years of experience in marketing and entrepreneurial leadership, Cheryl manages a team of eight overseeing marketing strategies, brand management, and creating content for social media, print, and digital platforms. She supports events, new products and services, and works closely with media partners to maximize exposure for that organization. Cheryl's committed to ongoing learning and skill development, mentoring students, and supporting entrepreneurs and newcomers. And again, I love that. I love learning every day too. And uh, um, it's important as an adult as well, so never forget that part. So I'll uh, I'll hand it over to Cheryl, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'll let her take it away. Awesome! Thank you so much, Adam. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Oh, I love that. Thumbs up. I feel like I do thumbs up a lot. Hello, how are you? See people waving, yeah. I know I'm in this little box, right? But this little box allows us to talk to so many people, right? I, I do have a bit of a presentation. So Adam, if I could, maybe I'll, I'll flip through that. Hey, we got a dancer. Woo. Um, <laughs> So, so what I want to do today is um, I'd like to, one, I'm going to just uh, introduce myself a little bit. Um, as Adam has identified, I've been, uh, you know, working in graphics since I was 18 years old, actually earlier than that, uh, because I was a, a child of art, as, as many of us are. Um, I've had the wonderful opportunity to study and learn art um, directly after high school. But um, when I moved to Ontario to study and then I came back, it was uh, a long time ago and there was something going on called a recession. So I didn't get to do all of the work that I had really hoped to do. So I went back to school and I took um, a communications degree that focused on information communications. So I got to study all about different media and the technologies that shape the world around us. So let's see, I'm not a Teams expert, I will say that, but let's see if I can share my window. Aha, so far so good. One of the things, I don't know how familiar, are you guys familiar with Brilliant Labs? Have you heard of us? Can I get a yeah, no? I don't hear anyone. I guess I, there's chats. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat the best I can. I got to think okay. most students know at this point, I would think, yeah, maybe, but All maybe right. not. I feel, like, I feel like we got a quiet group. So I'm going to see if I can liven some folks up here, OK? And um, OK, so can you all see my screen? Adam, can they see my screen? Yes, we can, yeah. Awesome, cool. So I love what, what, what you were saying, Adam, about, um, about the importance of tools and particularly uh, empathy, okay? So right here, you'll see, I'll just do, do a little plug here about us. So Brilliant Labs, yes, we work with students from K to 12. We also work with your teachers and, and folks with, like Adam. And our goal is to ensure that everyone has the tools that they need so they can be their most creative. And we help teachers and we give them the tools, the learning tools, so they push 
this beautiful world forward in the best capacity that we can. So this right here is a little QR code. It won't really work for you guys because you don't got you don't have your phones. Um, but later on, I'll share the URL. So in case your teacher wants to explore more with Brilliant Labs and to access funding, um, perhaps for next year or or have um, us come into the classroom, um, they can connect with us because because we love to do, uh, come in and see folks in person. All right. So, so yeah, today we are talking about the digital tools and the importance of collaboration. So I want to show you some of the tools that the students that I work with use. And um, have you guys heard of something called Canva? All right. I, I, I get that I'm not going to hear you. OK. Um, Canva is really a wonderful tool, a collaboration tool where many people can come together and work on the same item. Okay. Um, I use it with our students. I use it with our team. And the best thing about it is if I come in here, just as an example, and later I think, I don't know if they'll let me. Anyway, if I were to create a, a new doc, I could invite you all in here and we could work together on it. And you can actually see all the people that are working with this. So teachers and students, it works really well when you do have virtual learning and it works really well in the classroom so that um, together you can create uh, you know, projects, you can even edit some videos using Canva. And it has all the what we call assets or elements right along here. And for educators, like all of us and students, it's actually free. And that's a really cool word. I'm sorry. I work for a charity and free is pretty awesome. So I, if you get a chance, teachers and students to explore Canva, please do. And um, if you have any questions concerning it, uh, let me know, okay? Because uh, I can help you along the way. Other things, um, this is one that, uh, you know, high school students often use. Oh, excuse me. It's not gonna let me do it. This is the fun of technology too. Flags me too. <laughs> uh -huh. This is um, like vision boards, right? Like these are whiteboards and same type of idea. And, and there is a free version of this too, right? So you can go in here, you can start designing and, and collaborate with people from anywhere in the world. Adam, you mentioned about UI and UX. So, Man, I seven years ago or more, I created an app and it would interact with something called a beacon. And the goal, it works really well inside because we don't have satellites in, in buildings, right? So GPS uh, for mapping doesn't work inside a building. So I used a program that is very similar to this to wireframe my app. And you showed a slide earlier and you showed how you would outline it. And then the next phase would be kind of more gooey and, and some of the elements would work in it. And the third one is like a real prototype that you would actually show someone so that they could get really excited about it. So this is a tool that does that. And the best part about it is that a lot of these elements, like over here, you see this little hand. So a lot of these elements, you can actually do what we call linking. And when you click on it, it will actually mimic what the real app is going to do. So that really helps when you're collaborating with someone like a coder or a programmer, right? And it allows people like me who work with images and create images and illustrate, it allows me to kind of explain to the, the programmer how I want the app to work, 
how I want people to explore and use the app. Have you ever used a technology that doesn't work? I'm gonna pretend everyone's saying yes. I can't see you, but I'm pretty sure you're probably saying yes. So if that's the case, it's really frustrating, isn't it? So how do we get around that? You need people like me. <laughs> you need people who care. You need people with empathy to create these apps. And a lot of times people that do that are designers, artists, right? And all of you are designers. There's different types of design, okay? And let me just explore that for a second. There are different types of design. And what I mean by that is that we can design things and it doesn't always have to be like, like hard and plastic. We can design things by growing materials. I know there's a student, um, I think ADS North is here. Um, I know that there's a student that was growing um, from SCOBY using kombucha and bio leather. And bio leather is a great resource that you can actually grow and you can create products, right? That when you're done with them, they can be composted. And that's pretty cool. The image that you're seeing on your screen right now is um, working headphones that a student in St. John created. And the headphones are made from, can anyone guess what the headphones are made from? Someone's gonna have to put it in the chat or yell it out for me. I wanna guess, but geez. I don't know. Come on, people. What do you think the headphones are made from? What is it? Come on. Oh, There's oh. a lot of smart kids in Potatoes? there. Potatoes? Potatoes. That's interesting. I like that. Yeah, that's a good one. Potatoes have that skin, right? And it's really durable. I'd be curious to see what we can make from that potato skin. That's a really good guess. But it's not the right guess. A lot of kids don't like these. I used to like them only from cans. And I think it was because they were really salty. My mother used to put them on the pizza. A lot of kids don't like them now though, I don't think. Any guesses? It is not really a root. Uh, actually, it's a root. <laughs> not really a vegetable. Anyone? Maybe I'll zoom in here. Fungi. Oh, we have some winners. Congratulations. I wish I could throw you something. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's fungi. That really fun, awesome guy that, that grows in the ground called a mushroom. And mycelium is the roots of mushrooms. And this student used the roots of mushrooms chopped it all up, took cardboard, wrapped it in, cell put cellophane, I know plastic's not cool, but put cellophane in it, put it in a box, put it in a dark room, let it sit. Had to be at 25 to 26 degrees in the dark for a few weeks. What happens is that it starts to decompose the, the cardboard and it starts to create, you can see it here, it starts to create and, and over time, and then she ended up baking it and it, gets, it can get really hard. And she molded it and made it and grew her own headphones. And guess what? They work, they actually work. She can listen to music, she can listen to podcasts, they actually work. What was her point? Why would she do this? Can anyone tell me why she would do this? No one knows? 
deep, deep deliberation happening here. Uh -huh. <laughs> What's this? Can anyone, can you see this? What's this made out of? Plastic. plastic. Yeah. Look around your classroom. Do you see any plastic? Right here. Everywhere. <laughs> right. I saw a water bottle. Someone has a water bottle. You know, that's not so bad because you can reuse those, right? So a lot of things that we're talking about, and Adam mentioned it, is that we want to think about ways to design things that can solve some of these big questions and these big concerns that we have, right? And plastic. Plastic is absolutely everywhere. We have, for a very long time, had a big thing about plastic, right? My computer is made with plastic, right? My shoes even have plastic, <laughs> okay? So this student thought about all the plastics. They did exactly what you just did. They looked around and someone, I heard you say, it's everywhere, and that is 100% correct. So I ask you again, why did the student use mycelium to grow headphones? What are headphones made out of? Plastic. Uh-huh. And if it's made out of mycelium, what can you do when your headphones break? Anyone know? After you're done eating at night, does anyone have to compost their plate, like what's on their plate? Does anyone compost? You must compost. Yes. Some people must compost. Okay, cool. So this product, can be composted, okay? It's 98% compostable. So that is the problem that this student was solving, the plastic problem. So the question that was presented was, what if we could make everyday objects biodegradable, compostable? Then that way, when they break, or when we're done with them, we just put them in the compost. And then they go back to the soil. No problem, right? No problem. So that's that's part of this. And that's how called something called circular making economy. So that's the idea that everything that we can create, everything we can design can go from the ground, we can use it. And then when we don't want to use it anymore, if it breaks, it goes back into the ground again. So that's what this project was. And I, I bring it up because it's, it's incredible because we all wanna move forward to that. And the, the youth and the um, students that are working with the bio leather, that's a really cool thing. And you can make, you can make bags out of it. <laughs> yeah. You can make shoes out of it. Then that way we're not using animal products, right? So all of that are made by designers, artists, thinkers, okay? So I'll share these other ones um, later, but let me keep going on the idea here of design. So Adam shared with you the idea of um, the engineering process, right? So at Brilliant Labs, we, we agree with the engineering process. Sometimes we use the engineering process and then other times we use this process. And this process is Brilliant Labs plus the Stanford Design Thinking, okay? And, and what that, all that means is the goal is that We ask people to think about, like, have you ever woken up and we're like, 
you just had an amazing idea and you just had to, you know, get it down on paper or you had to build it, right? Like my nephew loves Lego and he's like a brilliant Lego master and he just has to get in there and do it. So this process is similar to the engineering process. However, we want you to take those ideas and just get very excited about it. We want to give you all the tools and everything that you need so that you can start creating that idea. However, this next point is incredibly important. Have you heard of empathy? Right? So empathy is that ability to literally put yourself in someone else's shoes. So as designers, when I'm designing, I just had this conversation earlier with one of my co-op students. When I'm designing the Brilliant Labs magazine, it's not just about words on a page, right? I really, really, really think hard about what is it going to look like, right? It's not just words on the page. It's telling an incredible story, right? So anyone can put some pictures down and wrap some text around it. But I created this picture right here. I don't know if you can see that. And I wanted to create something different to really illustrate microbes <laughs> and make microbes fun, if you can believe that. Because I read the article and, and Will, who is uh, one of our scientists, it actually spoke to me and I thought, wow, this is really cool. So I wanted to create an illustration to show how microbes are in us all. They're in, in the biology of our world and they're in us because we are of this world. So I wanted to really illustrate that through this image. So it's less about you know, putting material on pages and it's more about how do we tell the story? How do we tell the story by using the images? And the most important part of it is, is breaking it apart, pulling it back together and really thinking about it, okay? And caring, it's caring. You're, you're gonna start to hear a lot about like AIs and uh, that's artificial intelligence and, and um, how these tools can help um, professionals and engineers and, and um, everyone, even artists, to um, move faster. So if you can imagine we're already moving pretty fast, it's gonna speed up even more. The difference that uh, these AIs don't have, they are supposed to be, they are collaborators for us. They're no different than um, a rock. They're no different than a pencil. They're no different than any other technology that we have seen to this point. The difference is that they can surmise, they can take information and instead of doing big sweeping uh, Google searches to get a lot of information, later on you'll have to do a lot of research for essays and so forth. Instead of using a lot of that, they can surmise it, they can squish it down into one page for you. Um, but they are filled with biases and they are because the people that create them, right? And a bias is uh, um, an unknown judgment that you might have about something. So the difference between us and them is that we have to understand that they are tools no different than our computer, no different than a tool like Canva, no different than any other collaboration device that we would use. But we have empathy. And the empathy and the caring that you have is what makes you so awesome. And Adam said it, you said it so well, Adam. Youth have that incredible ability. I have seen kids in kindergarten to grade seven and beyond, but particularly within that range, that demographic, who have come up with the most brilliant ideas. And I'm not just saying brilliant because of brilliant labs. I'm telling you brilliant ideas. And it's because you are empathetic. It's because you can pick up an item and you can look at it and come up with new ideas. If a window breaks, I guarantee a kid 
your age would know how to fix it in 20 to 30 different ways than an adult who is my age. Because you have that free thinking, you're not um, put into the little box, right? And you have empathy. So empathy is an incredible piece of the design process, okay? And then we get into defining what the project is, defining, you know, um, you know, what the problem might be. Iteration, again, Adam used that word, and that's just, you know, thinking about it again and, and breaking it apart and, um, you know, figuring it out and making it work again. Then we get into our prototyping, and that's when we have that product that we are willing to share with someone, right? And then you got to test it to make sure it works. Chances are it probably won't. <laughs> if it does, cool. If it doesn't, that's okay. You just go back and you try it again. You try something new because every time you try something, it gets a little bit better every time. I do that with my designs. I'll show it to someone. They're like, Neh. I'm like, oh, okay. And I just kind of rip it apart and I, throw, I put it back together again. And it's always better the next time, right? So Adam, we're done at 12.30, correct? Or 2.30. Yeah, 2.30, yeah. Okay. So I wanted to do an activity, but again, this always gets to me. I always, I always love to uh, connect with people and, and chat. But maybe it's an activity that you guys can do with your teacher. So when you, when you have that time that you want to think about design, pitch up any object. Get in groups. I want you to think about what the object is. Turn it around, you know, put it on your head, whatever you need to do. Touch it, feel it. Then I want you to think about how do I make it more fun or how can I make it more accessible for someone? Like, for example, a pencil. Do we need a left hand of pencil? Do we need a right hand of pencil? Most people, right? Like. Do we need a pencil that is more useful for someone who can't hold their hands around it very well, right? So what are some of the objects in your classroom that could be designed better? Then think about it and think about how you can make that pencil, that plastic, not plastic. <laughs> how can you make the objects better, draw it out, design it, right? Talk with your group about it and then present it. But the most important part, reflect on the empathy, okay? That's the most important part because being human is pretty cool, right? But the most important thing is right here. And as long as you have that and you care about the world around you and, and the tools that people use, you can make those tools 10 times better. And that is why you're awesome. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, one last plug. We are hosting an innovation fair. I think, Adam, I, I think you're coming. I hope you're coming. And um, it's going to be in Moncton on May 11th. And um, there's so many kids coming to this. And your districts are, have all gotten the information. So I hope you have too. We'd love for you guys to come. There's going to be some really cool things happening. Over 2,500 students are, are coming to this in Moncton from Atlanta, Canada. We're flying kids in from Newfoundland. It's going to be so much fun. So anyway, I'm going to stop chatting now. <laughs> I want to say thank you so much. This has been absolutely awesome. Thank and, you. And, and I thank you, Cheryl. And I know in person is always the best, but we, you know, in this way, at least we can hit a few different schools around the province. And I love the innovation fair, right? And it's the first, you're, this is the first one back in person in a while. And the goal is like, this happens every year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we try. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, exactly. So if the students can't get involved this year, right? It's something to think about, right? Go like yeah. this summer as you're off and exploring and hopefully having fun. This is exactly the sort of stuff we want you to start thinking about. You never know what it'll end up, you'll end up creating, right? Until you try. Absolutely. So, I love yeah. that.
Well, I, I thank all everybody for thank joining. You. And, oh, thank you. And and Cheryl, thank you for jumping on and, and trying this out with me. And um, I love hearing from the practitioner. That's the most important thing to hear your creative brain. And we want all of our students to do the same sort of thing. So if there's any questions, I'll hang out for a little bit if you want. But I know usually <laughs> we're probably trying to get ready to go home at this point. So um, we thank you so much, everybody. And um, have a great evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> that was fun.